We've been walking through the story of Joseph, um, who is one of the um, 12 brothers, the patriarchs of Israel, one of the younger ones. And his story occupies a massive section of this book of Genesis, which is an interesting thing in and of itself, and has appealed to people throughout the years for different reasons. Um, But it is an extraordinary story in and of itself. You read it through, and it's just gripping and fascinating, the way his life went and the things that God did in and through him. And all the way through, one of the things I've been trying to emphasize is this, that I don't think the story of Joseph is so much about Joseph. I think the story is really about God. It's about the hand of God at work on the life of an individual. And I think that's why this story resonates with Christians and with with anyone, actually, who reads it. Because to be able to sort of glimpse behind the curtain, as it were, and understand the hand of providence and the way that God deals with individuals in their lives is one of the reasons why the narratives of of the Bible are so powerful. We read these stories, and it's not necessarily that these characters are are in and of themselves particularly praiseworthy or worthy of imitation. We read it because we're interested in the way that God deals with their lives. And then we can understand better his dealings with us. And I think something like that's going on when you look at the life of the story of Joseph, the story of the life of Joseph. Now, today our focus is going to move slightly because God hasn't only been dealing with this young man, Joseph. He's also been dealing with the brothers. And if you know anything of the story, it is that he had uh, 11 other brothers a younger brother, Benjamin, and then the ten sort of older brothers who come from different mothers than he comes from and with whom there is this great rivalry, such that they plot against him when he's 17 years of of age and they sell him into slavery and he's taken on one of those sort of caravans of traders from the land of Canaan, which is modern-day Israel or Palestine, down and across the Red Sea and into Egypt where he's sold to be a slave. He experiences profound injustices and also just immense suffering through his life and over particularly the first 13 years that he's in Egypt till he's about age 30. And then an extraordinary turn of events. In the providence of God, God raises him up to become prime minister of Egypt. And it's just a breathtaking thing that happens. And what we've been interested in so far is God's dealings with him. Now we're interested in what's happening with these brothers, who we've really not paid much attention to for the past couple of decades of Joseph's life. And then they reappear and they burst onto the scene. And here's how it all takes place. Joseph became prime minister around age 30, having laid out his plan or policy to save Egypt from future famine. And then over the next 10 years or so, he's put this plan into place. First of all, storing up massive stockpiles of grain <clears throat> so that when future famine was to come, the, the, the nation won't starve. And when the famine eventually does begin, about seven years into his premiership as the prime minister, <clears throat> his own family, who more or less have left him for dead, forgotten about him and, and no longer in his life, His own family are touched by this famine in Canaan. And Jacob, the elderly father, who's well over 100 years old at this point, sends the 10 sons down into Egypt, where they've heard the story of all this grain that's stored up, sends them down to go and buy grain and bring it back so that they can survive. These older brothers travel down to Egypt, and then this extraordinary thing happens in that they find themselves in a room face-to-face with their younger brother, but they have no idea it's him. He knows it's them. It's unmistakable, the group of them, dressed as they dress, speaking Hebrew, his mother tongue. But they do not recognize him. Now, this might at first seem to you to be an unbelievable thing until you factor in that he's about 23 years older than he was when he saw them then. He was a teenager. Um, He's dressed differently. He's speaking a different language. You know, he's, he's probably dressed like an Egyptian. He'll have a shaved head, probably makeup around his eyes, and one of those little man skirts that the Egyptians wore. And so, but he doesn't look like the brother that they knew was a 17 year old. And he's speaking a different language, as I said. If you look back at me when I was 17 years of age, there's not many photos in existence. So, if you ever do find one, then it's, it's a rare commodity. But there are a few around. I had long hair down to my shoulders. No beard. The hair would glisten in the sunlight. 
And uh, I, was, I, was, I was about 30 or 40% lighter than I am now. And um, so a different person. I was half the man I am today. And um, I met C not long after that. And, you know, the rest is history. And it's not all been good for my body, as you can see. Um, I've aged. She hasn't. And uh, I think something like that's going on. I don't, you know, they're looking at him and they do not know it's him. What's he going to do? Joseph, the scriptures tell us, treats them roughly. That's the word it uses. I love it. He treats them roughly. He accuses them of being spies, first of all. Puts them in prison overnight. And then he says, I'm going to release you on the condition that you go back to the land of Canaan and bring the youngest brother, Benjamin, who wasn't with them. And in order to ensure that this is what happens, he keeps one of them, Simeon, as a hostage. They travel back to Canaan. They tell Jacob what's happened. They've met this Egyptian ruler. This is what he said. We need to go back with Benjamin. Jacob is dismayed and heartbroken at the the thought of it because he's already lost Joseph, the son of his most favored wife. And Benjamin is, is the brother of Joseph. He doesn't want to lose both of them. But they run out of food again. So they have to send back to Egypt All these brothers travel, and this time they travel with Benjamin. They meet Joseph again. And on this occasion, he sells them the grain. And as he dismisses them, he sets up the test that is going to be definitive for the whole story. He lets them depart, but he hides his silver cup in the sack of grain that Benjamin's carrying. In other words, he sets them up to look like a thief. They're traveling out of town. They're traveling on their way back up and they're stopped. They're reprimanded by one of Joseph's stewards. And he challenges them. Why are you stealing from my my master? And they say, well, you can search us. If anyone's guilty, take him. And immediately start searching through the sacks of grain. Works from the oldest all the way down to the youngest. And finally, when he opens Benjamin's sack of grain, there in the mouth of the sack is this silver cup Joseph's own chalice. They are dragged back to go and meet Joseph. And when they're standing before him, this great dilemma presents itself, which is where we'll pick up the story. The striking thing that I'm interested in is that I think the whole test is a test of whether they have changed. Now let's pick it up from verse, chapter 44, verse 14. It says this, When Judah, the second oldest brother, and his brothers came to Joseph's house, he was still there. They fell before him to the ground. So you imagine their position. They look like thieves. And they look like before a very powerful man. They fall to the ground. No surprise there. Joseph said to them, What deed is this that you have done? Do you not know that a man like me can indeed practice divination? So you can see he's still posturing like he's any typical Egyptian at this point. And Judah said, what shall we say, my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how can we clear ourselves? God has found out the guilt of your servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also in whose hand the cup has been found. But he said, and this is Joseph, Far be it from me that I should do so. Only the man in whose hand the cup was found shall be my servant. But as for you, go up in peace to your father. So he sets up an opportunity. He says to them, in effect, I'll only keep Benjamin. You guys can go free. Judah continues. It says, then Judah went up to him and said, so he takes him to one side and begins to speak to him man to man. He says, oh, my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's ears. And let not your anger burn against your servant, for you are like Pharaoh himself. My Lord asked his servant, saying, have you a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, we have a father, an old man and a young brother, the child of his old age. His brother is dead, referring to Joseph. He thought he was dead. And he alone is left of his mother's children, meaning Benjamin. And his father loves him. Then you said to your servants, bring him down to me that I may set my eyes on him. And we said to my Lord, the boy cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. Then you said to your servants, unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you shall not see my face again. When we went back to your servant, my father, we told him the words of my Lord. 
And when our father said, go again, buy us a little food, we said, we cannot go down. If our youngest brother goes with us, then we will go down. For we cannot see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Then your servant, my father, said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons. One left me, and I said, surely he has been torn to pieces. Again, that's referring to Joseph, who Jacob thinks is dead. And I've never seen him since. If you take this one also from me, and harm happens to him, you'll bring down my gray hairs in evil to Sheol. In other words, I will die of a grief. And this is where Judah addresses Joseph so directly. He says, now therefore, as soon as I come to your servant, my father, and the boy is not with us, then as his life is bound up in the boy's life, as soon as he sees that the boy is not with us, he will die. And your servants will bring down the gray hairs of your servant, our father, with sorrow to Sheol. For your servant, and now he's speaking of himself, it gets confusing. Your servant became a pledge of safety for the boy to my father, saying, if I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father all my life. Now, therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the boy as a servant to my Lord and let the boy go back with his brothers. For how can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? I fear to see the evil that would find my father. The striking thing here, friends, is to begin to glimpse something of the transformation of heart that has taken place in Judah and the whole gathering of these brothers. They're changed men. And this transformation is interesting to me because as Christians, we're interested in the dynamics of spiritual renewal and spiritual change and spiritual transformation. Nobody is a Christian who hasn't first of all felt the need deep in their heart for change to take place. And nobody continues to walk with God in closeness of fellowship with God who doesn't continually feel the pressure of that desire to be changed and conformed, to become more like Christ. In other words, you, if you are a Christian, then by definition, you're someone who's interested in spiritual transformation and change in yourself and for others. And the Bible is not so much interested, by the way, in just the change, an external change, behavioral change. A lot of people misconstrue our faith in that way and think that what we're interested in is layering on top of your life a bunch of rules and regulations. But the Bible says that's not how change happens. Jesus, especially in his teaching, addresses it in this way. He always talks about change as being something that takes place from the inside out. That God is interested in transforming your heart The scriptures talk about about changing the heart of stone into a heart of flesh. In other words, what is cold, hard, and dead, giving you life. One of the images that's used is of a tree. And Jesus talks about our lives in this way, is that there is a sense of roots and there there are fruits. And if the roots are bad, then our lives cannot help but bring evil fruit to bear. But when the heart is changed, your behavior and your life and your whole way of living changes instantly. What I'm interested in then is this. If this is part of the great hope that we believe as Christians, how does God bring about change in us? What is he doing in our hearts when he changes us? These brothers stand before us as amazing examples of this kind of radical change that's taken place. Remember at one stage, in hatred, bitterness, and jealousy, they sell Joseph into slavery. And now presented with a similar test, a moment in which they can betray the other younger brother and get off scot-free and go home, we now get to witness a radical transformation of heart that's taken place within them. How does God change us? And I want to tell you that he does, it in, he does these three things, and this is what he wants to accomplish within us. He wants to humble your mind, he wants to invert your heart, and he wants to defeat your will. Humble your mind, invert your heart, and defeat your will. Let me show you what I think this means from this particular story. First of all, God wants to humble your mind. When you look at this profound transformation that's taken place in Judah, the second oldest of the brothers... You have to contrast it with what he once was. So when we look back more than 20 years into the past, 
before this moment. Judah is the brother who, when the brothers were thinking about how to get rid of Joseph, suggests to them that they should sell him into slavery. In other words, he sees a win-win opportunity. Not only can we get rid of our brother so that he'll be as good as dead to us and probably will die, but also we can get financial gain. It seems that he, along with the brothers, is motivated. What's at the root of this? What is going on in their hearts that they could be so evil towards Joseph? And I think the answer at the root of it all is pride. Pride gives birth, first of all, to jealousy. Jealousy is always a result of our pride, isn't it? Given the fact that jealousy is a sense that we're not getting the acknowledgement, love, or recognition that we deserve, and others are getting it instead. Judah and the brothers feel jealous that that Joseph is taking the father's affection. And so that pride is wounded. And then that pride swells into this kind of hatred in which they take ownership, as it were, of Joseph and think that they can sell him into slavery as though he was their property. And now, these decades later, we see a profoundly different man standing here in this moment in which he is being tested. He's a broken man. If once he had the the arrogance of heart and the hatred of heart to sell his brother, something has changed in him. Now, there are parts of Judah's story that that you won't know necessarily if you haven't read all these chapters and sordid events that have taken place in which he ends up sleeping with one of his daughters-in-law thinking she's a prostitute as though that was some excuse. Judah is humiliated through the whole experience. And certainly that's part of why. But here he is, and I think this is what's going on here. Here he is in a position of absolute need. He is powerless before this mighty ruler who he doesn't know is his brother. And in this position of abject humiliation and need and brokenness, he's being changed. You can see it in the language he uses here when he addresses Joseph as my Lord and refers to himself as your servant and describes Joseph as being like Pharaoh himself. So this brother who once high-handedly could sell Joseph into Egypt is now groveling in the dust. He's humbled to the ground. Friends, the reason why I draw your attention to this dynamic of of what's happening in his heart, because I believe one of the the most central elements of, of what God has to do in us and accomplish in us is that the necessary first step for change always in the Christian life is to bring about humility. I say that because if you think about the what pride does in the human heart, pride is always the fundamental obstacle to change. It's the inability in you to recognize your need for change, and then, even upon seeing it, the inability to ask for, ch- for help, and particularly to come to God. May this pride that lurks within the human heart always expresses itself in one of two directions. It either turns into rebellion or religion. It turns into rebellion in, in when our pride says, I know better than God. And every time you do something that you know is wrong, but that you feel in that moment you must do, that's an expression of prideful rebellion. And all of our sin is in some way characterized like that. Or pride becomes religion in the human heart, which is I can secure my relationship with God. I can improve my life. I can get closer to God. I can be self-sufficient in my pursuit of transformation. And very often these two things, rebellion and religion, mingle and interweave together in that we can maintain a posture, a religious posture, but our hearts can be cesspits of sin. Underneath all of it, always at the foundation of our failure as humans is this pride And so, when God wants to deal with us, the first thing he has to do is start to dismantle that. And you can see how he does it. We've been noticing in the story of Joseph that when he was 17 years old, he was an arrogant young man, unpleasant to be around, so irritating that his brothers hated him. And I don't think it was all their fault. He was was puffed up. He was pampered, he was entitled, he was spoiled, he was proud. What does God do with him? We've seen, haven't we, how God subjects him to pain. 
how he experiences injustice, how he has to throw himself upon God as his only friend abandoned in Egypt, and how through all of this, gradually, Joseph is formed and shaped and molded to become the man of stature that he becomes, and ultimately God can entrust him with becoming this savior of his own people. But now we're seeing something like that happen in Judah and his brothers. These men also were arrogant and proud. And now God has begun to press press them and mold them and break them and shape them. Not least through the fact that they find themselves in a posture of abject need. They don't even have food to put on their tables unless they come begging in Egypt, as it were. But also there's been something else going on in the background, in their hearts, all through these 20 plus years. We see it a little earlier in the story when Joseph starts to begin to treat them roughly. They have a little council together as brothers and they said this to one another. They say, in truth, we are guilty concerning our brother, Joseph, in that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us and we did not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us. What a fascinating thing to say. The first, time, in the first um, moment of suffering that they encounter, the first thing they begin to think is, we're suffering because of the wrong we committed 23 or so years ago. That's guilt, isn't it? When it's as though it was yesterday. Now, they don't know that they're dealing with Joseph at this point, do they? But it's still so present in their mind that as soon as they encounter suffering, they think, oh, this is because we're guilty. And then you see it again in how Judah starts to speak to Joseph. How he says to him, God has found out the guilt of your servants. Now, at that point, I don't think that Judah thinks that Benjamin is a thief. But he's not wanting to plead innocence. It's almost like he's resigned to the fact that they deserve whatever punishment's coming to them because they're guilty of a sin that they don't think Joseph knows about. Can you see how circumstances, suffering and need and lack and the poverty that they were beginning to experience as well as the guilt that's been simmering under the surface for these past two decades or so, how these things conspire to break them apart and and pull them into pieces and humble them before Joseph and before God. And it seems to me, because I've seen this too many times to count, that this is exactly what God does. It may be the case that you will experience a persistent sense of guilt and conscience about some wrong in the past or something you're doing now. And maybe that you confront some inadequacy or sense of failure in your life where you suddenly realize that the, what you thought was true of yourself is no longer true or that you are not as capable as you thought you were. Or you go through some pain that you cannot escape, some prolonged suffering. Or you just honestly one day wake up and begin to appraise your life as so many people do when they reach middle age. And your eyes are open and you begin to see that you didn't accomplish the things you wanted to accomplish, and you're humbled. God can use any kinds of means he chooses, but friends, the point is this. Nobody ever comes to God unless, first of all, their hearts are humbled in this way. But this is what's so extraordinarily good about the work of God. He knows how to deal with us. He knows how to break us. He knows how to bend us and to make us malleable under his hand. There is on the other side of this extraordinary hope. When Jesus is uttering those eight or nine statements that are called the Beatitudes, the the statements of blessedness or happiness, the first four, the first four, describe this entryway into spiritual happiness and joy through the path of humility. Listen to them. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Which is to say, you're blessed when you realize that you're spiritually bankrupt. That you have nothing to offer to God. At that point, he gives you everything. He says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. 
In other words, it's not the people who are skipping around thinking their life is perfect who will experience the comfort of God. It's the people who come to him in grief and brokenness who then know the comfort of the Holy Spirit. He says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. A meek person is someone who gives up, stops fighting for their rights, accepts the sovereign hand of God. And he says, at that point, God can give you everything. And he said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. In other words, someone who honestly stops and appraises their life and says, I have desires that nothing I've ever encountered in this world has ever met. I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, there is spiritual reality that nothing is meeting and satiating. At that point, Christ says, you'll be satisfied. There is no maturity in the Christian faith except descent into into humility. It's in being emptied that you're full. It's in being abased that you're dignified. It's in being in your face that you're raised up into the presence of Christ. And it seems to me that when we look at the lives of these brothers, God humbled them and crushed them and broke them in order that they could be changed men. God wants to humble your mind. Then, a second thing is that he wants to invert your heart. And what I mean is that he wants to turn you inside out. And I'm talking about the capacity to love. Now, I think that in order to understand this point, we have to begin by addressing what is one of the most prevalent, commonplace lies that we live with in our society, in our culture at large, that is really a very modern Western way of thinking, but has become so integral to the way that we think about life and health and happiness that we just take it for granted, which is this, that we believe that the foundation of a healthy mind and emotions is the ability to love yourself. The epitome of this, it seems to me, in our day and age, almost the argument ad absurdum or taken to an extreme is the growing trend for individuals to marry themselves. It's seen as a kind of heroic or brave statement of me learning to love myself. I am enough for me. Such a tragedy. Now I can see the thinking, of course, in this counsel, this advice, you need to love yourself, and that self-hatred and self-loathing are not particularly helpful ways of thinking. As any of us who very experienced bouts of this in our lives will know. But the doctrine that you have to love yourself in order to be healthy and happy and fulfilled is flawed for two reasons. The first is this. Love for yourself will always be vacuous and dissatisfying. You ever, it's like that experience of buying yourself a gift or sending yourself a Valentine's Day card if ever you've done that. It's neither, you know, give yourself a gift, it's not a surprise, nor is it really a gift. And it is dissatisfying. The human heart cannot be filled by trying, attempting to fill itself. Your heart was created to experience the love of another, and particularly of the Lord who made you. That's one reason why I think this is a flawed way of thinking. Another is this. The love for ourselves, putting ourselves first, always and inevitably leads us down paths that can ultimately take us to our most wicked acts as humans. Previous generations just called it for what it is. They said it was selfishness. We call it self-love. And it's the kind of reason that's given, for example, when, when someone abandons their spouse and family and says, I just need to focus on me for a while. You just want to slap them around the face and say, wake up, don't be so stupid. The scriptures offer another remedy altogether. The Bible says that we are all together far too obsessed with ourselves in the first place. And that even our problems, and look, all of us struggle at times with this, myself included. Even our problems, when we analyze them and and diagnose it as a lack of self-esteem or whatever you want to describe it, very often circling at the heart of that is an obsession with ourselves seems to me that the darkest moments we ever get into is when we're thinking about ourselves all the time. The Bible says that liberty and happiness and joy and life comes when God 
enables you to be self-forgetful. Now, this is only possible, I believe, when your heart is filled with the love of God. When you receive acceptance as one of his children. And then out of that flows a responsive love to the maker and then also to his image in fellow mankind. And the person whose life is filled with God's love becomes a conduit of that love towards others. And in this is joy and happiness and life and peace. God's grace received and then flowing out to others. And it seems to me that this is the very thing that we're beginning to see happen in the life of Judah and his brothers, but particularly in Judah. I told you how his early life was marked by, consumed by, jealousy and hatred that gnawed at him and ate him up from the inside such that he could even contemplate killing or selling his own brother. How dark and sordid his mind and heart had become. And now an opportunity presents itself for him to once again assert that selfish desire and orientation by allowing his youngest brother to take the fall and all of them return back home to Canaan and just abandon Benjamin. He could have made the, almost the exact same decision with Benjamin as they made with Joseph. And what do we see instead? We see a heart of love beginning to emerge within Judah. He begins to plea with Joseph and tell him that when he returns home to his father, if the boy's not with us, he says, as my father's life is bound up in the, li- in the boy's life, as soon as he sees that the boy is not with us, he'll die. And we'll, we'll kill him, he says, in effect. Can you see how Judah's whole outlook has changed? Perhaps seeing his father's grief all those years before when Joseph did not return home with them is enough to have broken him. And now he's not interested in his own What happens, he's not interested in himself anymore. He's interested in his father. And he's interested in his baby brother, Benjamin. And he wants to somehow put to rights the wrong that was done all those decades before. But friends, don't miss this. That it all comes out of a heart where love has begun to bloom, to blossom within Judah's heart. This is, here's what I'm talking about. The theologians Augustine and later Luther, so we're talking the 400s and the the 1500s, they used this expression to capture what they thought was the essence of the human problem. They said our problem is this. The problem of sin can be captured in this way, that we are curved in on ourselves. You ever experienced an ingrown toenail? An ingrown toenail is a toenail that is so malformed that it begins to grow not in the direction that it ought, out, but round and in. And it is as painful as it sounds, by all accounts. And if, a, if the toenail grows deep enough into your toe, eventually it will cause infections and all kinds of problems, and a surgeon has to get in there and remove the thing. Luther... Augustine, they said that our problem is with our souls is our souls have curved in on ourselves. There's a sickness there that in our inbuilt, intuitive proclivity to put ourselves first and to love ourselves, that is the problem with us. That is the essence of our sickness. And as soon as we begin to enthrone ourselves in this way, what follows is sickness and malady and misery. And that's exactly what these brothers have endured for the last 23 years or so. That act of cruelty that was motivated by selfishness and self-interest when they sold Joseph has eaten up their souls for all this time. I don't think Judah could bear to do it again. But when God's love begins to shine upon us, our hearts are inverted. They're turned inside out. And no longer do we focus upon me and my needs, but we begin to turn outwards in love for God and love for our fellow man. It seems to me that all the way through the New Testament, this is emphasized again and again. Often through the language of giving and generosity. Freely you've received, Jesus says. Now freely give. 
He's saying the grace of God's been lavished on your heart. Now, now give it away abundantly. That's the essence. That's the, almost the defining characteristic of a Christian. Is someone who is so lavish in love and kindness and mercy and in generosity in every part of their life. It's the evidence that you've received the love of God. A miserly Christian is a contradiction in terms. And here's how Jesus puts it in Luke chapter 6. He says, love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you'll be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. When he says you'll be sons of the Most High, what he's saying is you will bear the family likeness. God is generous to his enemies. You and I, we were all enemies of God. He was kind to us. He gave his son on the cross. And when the love of God begins to shine on your soul and you begin to perceive the unmerited love and kindness and favor that he's given to you, the response is that I must become like my father and be as generous as he is. And he says, give. Jesus says, give, love, expect nothing in return, just be lavish. That's the inverted heart. You're born selfish. You're born grabbing, stealing, taking, possessing. God's love shines on you and you open your hands. He inverts your heart. Lastly, he wants to defeat your will. At this point, we reach the turning point in the whole of the story of Joseph's life. Remember that he has been estranged from these, his brothers, for 20 plus years. Almost a lifetime in a sense. Such a distant memory had it been to him. And then he takes this opportunity to test them and to see, are they the same men who sold me all those years ago? And the breaking point comes when Judah turns in their final moments to Joseph and makes this final plea. He says in verse 33, Now therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the boy as a servant to my Lord, and let the boy go back with his brothers. Judah offers, in effect, to die. Because for all he knew, that would be the fate that would await him so that Benjamin and his brothers could go free. In that, something cracks. And Joseph, in the next chapter, the very next verses, he's undone by what he's just witnessed. It tells us in chapter 45 that Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. He sees with his eyes the extraordinary transformation that's happened in his brothers such that one of them will step up and say, I'll take his place. And he's broken open by the experience. He sends all of his servants out the room and he begins to weep uncontrollably and tell them, I'm Joseph, I'm Joseph. I think this scene pictures for us in a profound way the gospel in a couple of dimensions here. In one sense, it's an image of us standing before God in the way that these brothers stand before their younger brother, Joseph. Joseph has, in a sense, played the role of God in this situation, testing them, crushing them, hurting them, bruising them, putting them to the test, bringing them to this point of opportunity and transformation, to this point where they reach the choice. Will they save themselves and then die in their shame? Or will they repent be changed and do the right thing and save the younger brother. And then we know the consequences of what happens as a result of that. And Judah chooses the right choice. He gets on his face in abject, total surrender before Joseph. And out of this flows the power for reconciliation. And in a sense, this is what happens when you're brought before God. God puts before you a choice. Take hold of your life and die eternally or let go of your life and live with me. And it's only when we take the posture of Judah in this story in that we say, God, I want to die to myself, that we are then experiencing, able to experience the reconciliation with our father that followed just like it followed in this story. To me, this is a wonderful picture 
of the transformation and where that transformation leads in the heart when you're able to repent and surrender, when your will is defeated before God. But the picture is another, is also, the story also pictures the gospel in another way. Think about this. How in a sense, Judah also represents Christ in this, doesn't he? Do you know that Jesus is actually descended from Judah? These 12 brothers represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And Jesus was biologically descended from Judah. He's called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And it seems that Judah, his, his ancestor and father, as it were, biologically, he is like Christ in this, in that he assumes the pace of leadership above his brothers in order that he can be a substitute on their behalf. And he surrenders his will there in that moment, willing to die in the place of Benjamin so that the others can be offered life and go free. And he accomplishes, by the offering up of himself before Joseph there, Judah accomplishes the reconciliation and out of which will flow all the flourishing and joy that will come back to that family in the years that follow. What amazing picture of the gospel. Jesus is like Judah. Judah. Our older brother who bowed down in Gethsemane and said to the father, not my will, but your will be done. And in that moment, accomplished for us, and when he died on the cross, accomplished for the reconciliation that allowed us to go back into the presence of God with everything wiped clean. What do we need to see, friends? We need to see this. God will deal with you like Joseph dealt with his brothers. He might bruise you, test you, and crush you in order to accomplish these results that we see in these men, to humble your mind, to invert your heart and give you a heart of love and to defeat your will ultimately. But the power for the change that we're talking about, we're talking about the spiritual dynamic of change that takes place in the heart, the power of change in the Christian life is in knowing that there is a Savior who's offered himself for us in the garden and then on the cross. And in, in doing so, accomplished the reconciliation once and for all that we can be reconciled to the Father. And in that is the guarantee that if you, like Judah, die to yourself as he does before the Father, on the other side of that death is the life that Christ won for you by his death and resurrection. And so two paths lie before us. There's the path of rebellion and selfishness in which we try to cling to what is ours and in so doing seal our doom and our misery. And then there is the path in which God humbles us and breaks us and defeats us and in the emptying of ourselves before the cross, he takes hold of us, makes us his own, lavishes upon us all the goodness of heaven. What an amazing picture of the gospel this story is. And there's more to come as we look at the forgiveness that Joseph offers us. How is God dealing with you? Are you conscious of these changes taking place or of God wanting to bring about these changes in you? To humble you, to give you a heart of love, to defeat that will, that stubborn will. I want us to bow our heads now as we respond in worship. Jono and the musicians are going to come and lead us in a response. We're going to take some time to respond to God in worship this evening. But I want us to begin by coming to the table, as it were, to eat the bread and drink the wine. I often think that when we eat the bread and drink the wine... It is always best done not only in a posture of celebration, because in one sense it is a celebration of what Christ has done, but also in a posture of confession. And those two things are linked together. Confession and celebration are tightly bound together in the Christian life. To be able to release our burdens before the cross and then celebrate our freedom in Christ. So even now as we bow our heads and pray, take this moment, this opportunity, before you eat the bread and before you drink the wine, to come before God in confession and ask for his grace in a fresh way today.